Okay, so thank you all, um, and thank Lucy for a great presentation regarding ALS research. We're gonna continue with that theme right now and focus uh, on ALS research in the federal government. Today we have two great presenters uh, who are collaborators working at the Department of Defense and at uh, CDC. And then afterwards we'll have some questions. It's a little bit different uh, than our session yesterday where we really had a discussion about our public policy efforts and advocacy. Um, so I just wanted to remind all of our friends in the audience that the questions today will be really about the science and the program and not about our advocacy efforts. We'll be revisiting those uh, issues in our delegation meetings this afternoon, as well as a question and answer period at the end of uh, today. So to get started, uh, we have uh, Dr. Leidy from the Department of Defense. So thank you. Happy almost afternoon to everyone. I'm very excited to be here to tell you about the research that's been going on at the Department of Defense. But before I do that, I need to thank the ALS Association for asking me here today. And also thank all of the patients, the family members, the caregivers that year after year go to the Hill and continue to demonstrate need for continued funding in this devastating disease. So thank you all for your efforts. Okay, so this is my clicker here. Okay. So the ALS research program is managed and executed by an office called the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, so, or CDMRP. CDMRP, much like NIH, awards federal research dollars for human health research. However, we're not as large. We have disease-specific funding, and we don't align with HHS but rather we're under the Department of Defense. Specifically, we're under the Army. Within the Army, we're under the Medical Research and Materiel Command. So this command has a long history of biomedical research, mainly products in support of the warfighter. But it's also important to note that about a quarter of the vaccines that are licensed for use in the US have resulted from military research efforts. So this command has a very long history of biomedical research. And that's where our office, CDMRP, sits. So although we are managed and executed through the DOD, we operate through many partnerships, all with a common goal of improving health. So our first important members, as I mentioned at the beginning, are our advocates, who continue to demonstrate need year after year to their congressmen. But not only do they participate in advocacy efforts, they also participate in every level of our program execution. They have a seat at the table next to me, next to the clinicians, next to the funded investigators, helping us decide strategy, investment strategy, program announcements, funding opportunities, and then they help us select the research that best addresses those program announcements. They bring a much needed passion and perspective and they ensure the human dimension is incorporated into every aspect of our program cycle. So program lines can also originate from Congress members with special interests. And it's important to note that the funds for our programs are not part of the president's budget for the DOD, but rather are added on top. So the funding for our program does not take away from the DOD's budget, but our funds are disease specific. So if funds are appropriated for ALS research in a fiscal year, they have to be spent in the ALS research field. So I've already talked about how we're managed and executed through the DOD. Uh, we, in addition to CDMRP, work with regulatory offices, such as the Office of Research Protection, ensuring human and animal compliance, and also our acquisitions office to ensure budget requirements. Our last important partners are the researchers. So not only those researchers that we fund that propose outside the box ideas, but also those researchers that work with us to select the best proposals that will identify innovative research likely to create paradigm shifts. 
So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about our history. In the early 90s, grassroots advocacy efforts really heightened political awareness of health issues. So the most successful of these groups, one of the most successful of these groups, was the Breast Cancer Coalition. This was a group consisting of breast cancer survivors and local leaders in nearly every state. And they managed to hand deliver 600,000 letters to their members of Congress. And in 1992, they summoned a group of researchers to the Hill, and they had in hand a detailed proposal for a $300 million appropriation for breast cancer research. Well, in fiscal year 93, Congress responded, and they appropriated $210 million to the DOD budget for breast cancer research. So MRMC, who had the long history of biomedical research, was directed to manage this new breast cancer program. Because of the size of the appropriation, the Army sought the advice of the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. And their recommendations were to develop a two-tier review process, so a scientific merit review, followed by a second-level programmatic review, and also to establish a new model for research that incorporates the patient advocates into program policy, investment strategy, and research focus. So we immediately adopted these practices, and we still implement them today. So the success of that initial breast cancer program brought a wave of innovative research, and Congress was so impressed that they have added over 37 funded research areas to our management. So between 92, where there's a single purple bar for the breast cancer program, all the way to fiscal year 2014, where there's over 30 research programs managed by CDMRP, and $8.7 billion have gone through our program. So why ALS? Well, in 2007, Congress directed DOD involvement in a dedicated ALS research program, not only because it's a national health issue for which there is no cure, but also because veterans of the US Armed Forces are twice as likely to develop ALS. So since 2007, our vision has been no less than to improve treatment and find a cure for ALS. Our mission is to fund preclinical research to develop new innovative treatments for ALS. So this is really our niche in the field, this preclinical space. We do not fund understanding of the basic biology, so identifying those genes, and we don't fund clinical trials, but we fund that space right in between. So this is our integration panel, our advisory committee. So these are the people that help us with our investment strategy, help us decide which program announcements we are going to release, and ultimately recommending for funding those that best meet the intent of the program. So you can see our chairs, your very own Lucy Bruin, who we just heard from this morning. We also have a nice mix of clinicians, PhD investigators, and consumer advocates all on our advisory panel. So this is a synopsis of our funding. Since 2007, we've received $46.9 million in appropriations, which have resulted in 34 awards. And this is the distribution of our funded portfolio. Our largest investment has been to identify novel targets for therapeutics. We also have funded a number of high throughput screens, drug pharmacology and delivery, and some transplantation studies. So this slide shows the various molecular targets that we have invested in. And these have been studied for their ability both to protect neurons from neurotoxicity, but also to block disease progression. And we heard, of many, we heard about many of these this morning, including SOD1, C9, and the TAR DNA binding protein, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the studies investigating this gene here. So Dr. Drapeau, this is a wonderful example of finding and moving drugs from the bench all the way to the bedside. So Dr. Drapeau was funded to screen small molecule modifiers of TDP43 using model systems. So in the diagram here, you can see his fish model. So the ALS phenotype was induced. Juvenile fish were added to a well of a 96 well plate, and his small molecule modifiers which you can see on the left, were added to each well. And then he could monitor which juvenile fish had 
changes in mobility in response to these drugs. So after screening hundreds of drugs through this um, high throughput method, he identified a class of drugs called neuroleptics, specifically the neuroleptic, neuroleptic pimazide, which restored mobility in all of his models. So not just his fish model, but also his worm model and confirmed in his mouse model. So Dr. Drapeau took this preliminary data to industry outside of our funding and has initiated a stage two randomized clinical trial to look at the effects of pimazide in ALS patients. And this is expected to recruit 100 patients across eight ALS clinics in Canada. So another example of preclinical development is Dr. Silverman. Dr. Silverman was funded to do a high throughput screen of compounds that target and alter the function of SOD1. So using his high throughput method, he identified a handful of compounds that were successful in altering the function of S mutant SOD1. One particular compound, compound 11, when tested in a mouse model system, was found to extend life by 31%. So you can see in the figure here, percent survival is on the y-axis and age is on the x. The control untreated population and the highest dose of compound 11 showed uh, survival out to about 136 days, whereas the two intermediate doses of compound 11, the 20 milligrams per kilogram and 10 milligrams per kilogram, extended life longer than 170 days. So this was an unprecedented survival. Um, that was published in the literature. And Dr. Silverman continues to modify this compound, what he's calling compound 11. He's trying to improve its stability and continues to test it in other mouse models. So we're excited about this compound. Another effort is to improve the efficacy of Riluzol. So Dr. Passanelli of Thomas Jefferson University hypothesized that the modest effects may be due to disease-driven resistance involving membrane transporters, specifically P-glycoprotein, that may pump the drug out of the cell. So you can see in this figure, P-glycoprotein is inserted into the cell membrane and the opening is on the inside of the cell. So the drug is pumped through that opening back out of the cell. So there is Elacridar, which is a known P-glycoprotein inhibitor. So the chemical structure is shown here it blocks this open entrance. So Dr. Passanelli combined these two drugs in her mouse model. And this combination therapy of Riluzol plus Elacridur increased CNS central nervous system penetration, muscle function, and slowed progression in her mouse model. So this is a very exciting combination therapy. And this too was published just recently. So in addition to drug development efforts, we have also funded other therapeutic approaches, such, such as Dr. Boulis's uh, overcoming practical barriers of spinal cord cell transplantation. So Dr. Boulis used a mini pig model to determine tolerance and toxicity of human spinal cord stem cell transplantation. And to date, he's found an optimal volume and concentration of stem cells, and he's also found an optimal delivery technique. He's currently addressing the immunosuppressive issues associated with, tra with transplants. So lastly, out of our funding, I wanted to just raise this very important point that even if we do not have a tangible drug in hand, our funding has led to many researcher resources, including stem cell lines from sporadic, familial, and control patient samples, numerous mouse models, and unique model systems to study specific aspects of the disease. And these resources are now available for worldwide research sharing. So what's newly in the pipeline? In fiscal year 2014, we received just under 60 full applications, and four awards were announced this past December. And here you can see the recipients of those awards. The first two are looking at SOD one uh, targets for therapeutics, and the other two are looking at the C9 gene, which we heard about this morning. So we're very excited to see what comes out of these newly funded investigations. So looking ahead in FY15, we again received a $7.5 million appropriation. We offered two mechanisms, the Therapeutic Idea Award 
and the Therapeutic Development Award. So these two awards both search for candidate therapeutics for ALS, but at different stages along the preclinical pipeline. So the TIA, or the Therapeutic Idea Award, looks for those ideas that are really early in the stage of development. So those high risk, high reward ideas. So because we're looking for innovation, these awards do not require preliminary data. The TDA is a little further down the pipeline. The um, applicants must have a druggable target or a potential drug therapeutic in hand and will fund the preclinical testing. This mechanism is very empirical and product driven. And because of that, for this uh, award, preliminary data is required. So this is our investment strategy for these two mechanisms. We anticipate funding two of the bigger therapeutic development awards for a million dollars over a two year period of performance. We anticipate funding four therapeutic idea awards for 500K over a two year period of performance. So this is our website. If, if any of you have not visited our website, I encourage you to go. We do on our homepage rotate researcher highlights and consumer highlights. And this particular highlight is for Matt Bellina. He p was a peer reviewer for us this last round. Um, the newly diagnosed, incredible perspective. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting him and just had to write a consumer story about him. So I encourage everyone to go to our website and, and read Matt's story. So although I get to be up here and be the face you associate with the DOD program, we actually operate through uh, many, many team members. So I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge both our leadership and every member of our ALS research team. And with that, I will happily take any questions. I see a hand over here. I think we're rushing to get a microphone. Hi, I had a question where I saw a lot of Army references on the slide. Is it the right. Army's leading all the services research? You know, I got 26 years Air Force. I don't mind the Army, but, you know, <laughs> I'm hoping the Air Force is part of this same program in the Navy and uh, Yes, yeah, so our program is executed and managed by the Army, but we do have investigators from all components uh, within the military research organizations applying for our funding. Good purple use. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, my name is Diane Price, and I'm from Arizona. I can't thank you enough for the effort and money you put into research, but my question is, has anybody ever looked at what is causing ALS? So there's a lot of work going on in that area, particularly at NIH, and you just heard this morning, the ALS Association has funded a lot uh, to look for those genes that are associated um, with ALS. So our niche really is at that preclinical space to, to target those genes that have been identified. Um, and I think Lucy put up the, the suite of genes that have come a long way since the original discovery of that SO1, SOD1 gene. Hi, I'm from Nashville, New Hampshire, and we've been dealing with ALS for the last three years as far as identified. We've known for a while something was wrong. My husband is one of the people that was in the military in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we're really grateful for the things that the VA are doing. But in the meantime, I own a wellness facility, so we started a lot of research on natural approaches to not necessarily a cure, but to have quality of life as people go through the process waiting for the cure. What kind of research is being done? What kind of allocations for, re, um, for funding and stuff are there? Because we're at a point right now where we're, we're trying to introduce people to ways to enhance the body and keep it strong and healthy through the avenues for your departments to work on that other piece. What kind of research is being put into that? Because I am extremely um, excited about the things that we're seeing where we are, but I don't know where to go to either participate 
or support an organization in some way or begin an organization in some way to take care of that research on that end. Right, so as I mentioned at the beginning, we do have uh, consumers on our integration panel that helps us kind of shape our vision and help us recommend for funding investigations that would look at aspects such as those. So it is very important to have voices such as yours on our panel. Um, again, our, our focus is really preclinical drug development. That's our little, our, our little niche in this big field. Um, but we'd be very interested to have you um, participate in our program. Uh, our program book is actually in uh, your binders, and I do have a card here, so if anyone is uh, wanting to participate in our program, please just touch base with me after the talk. That's a, that's a great uh, question also to ask in the Ask the Researcher section. Uh, Lucy and some of her colleagues will be around the research booth, and she will have a bigger picture um, that is beyond the Department of Defense program to discuss. Thank you. So I do have a, a, another federal partner here um, I think we have some who's going to speak. Oh, I'm sorry. More questions. Wonderful recommendations for our sessions tomorrow from the uh, staff. Uh, the advocacy staff, but I'm wondering from your particular perspective and the interaction that you have with different members as an administrator of this particular program, do you have any suggestions or recommendations you might give us that, that you think would resonate particularly well this year versus other years uh, in, in the discussions we have tomorrow as it, as it relates to your ALS research program? So I think we heard this morning that there's a lot of work going on in biomarkers and really designing trials to target patients that are going to respond by looking at their genomics. Uh, I think that can lead to uh, faster, more reliable trials. So uh, I think efforts into genomics and biomarkers and biorepositories is really something that's worth investing in. And we actually, with our Therapeutic Development Award, we are encouraging engagement biomarkers in parallel with designing your drug so you can test in the clinic how effective your drug is at the same time you're, you're developing it to go towards clinical trials. So I think that those are import, really important aspects to push for continued funding. Uh, yeah, I, I actually can't, go ahead. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, our partners in the federal government are not allowed by law to advocate, so we wouldn't want to get them in trouble, but we'd be happy to talk to you <laughs> offline about that, as well as our session this afternoon. And that's why we really have tried to frame this session to be about the science about the programs, because both our colleagues are federal employees, and we don't want to have any sort of problems. <laughs> yes. I just had a, um, an observation on one of your slides. Um, I don't recall breast cancer being a service-connected disease, and they got $300 million, and we have veterans, including myself, and we're only asking for 10. Um, maybe, um, maybe the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Maybe we can take a lesson from right. what they did, and I mean, that, right. It was a very, very uh, strongly led advocacy effort. And at that time, uh, there was no DOD funding in, in disease-specific research. So, so they, really, they really set the stage and, and paved the way. And, and now they open the door for these other types of disease research. So it, and it really was the effort of, of the advocates and scientists who went to the Hill and advocated for funding. So it, it just underscores the need to do this year after year. Okay, well, thank you very much. You're